morning, everyone. Welcome to Construction Cast. Um, we're back with Series 7 of Construction Cast this morning. I can't believe it has been so long we've been running so far. This morning, we're going to be talking about the Party Walls Act, which is one of those things that probably touches everyone at some point in their lives, um, even those outside the construction industry. So it's a little bit different from our usual topics that are a little bit more niche in, in our field. So we've got two speakers with us this morning. As always, please join us in the chat if you've got any questions for those. Um, first up, we've got Dr. Laura Lintop, who, as well as being a full-time construction solicitor, Laura is a visiting fellow at King's College. London teaching on the construction law and dispute resolution MSc program which I know a lot of our regular viewers have either completed or are in the process of completing. Um, she's also a supervisor for undergraduates in land and private law at the University of Cambridge and has recently completed her PhD at the University of Cambridge focusing on party wall disputes looking at the legal coherence and dispute management so she's a really well versed in this topic this morning. Uh, she might be a familiar face to those of you who tune in regularly to construction class because she joined us for the discussion with Lord uh, with Justice Coulson on the 150 years of the Technology and Construction Court. Um, if you missed that episode, you'll find it in the usual place over on our YouTube channel. Secondly, this morning, we're delighted to have Lord John Lytton joining us. Lord John Lytton entered the House of Lords in 1985 by succession. He then left the House of Lords in 1999 following the passage of the House of Lords Reform Act and then was re-elected in 2011. He was responsible for taking the Party Walls Act through all of its Lord stages. And we'll be talking about how that process works and, and how we did that a little bit later on in the session. He's also a member of the Ad Hoc Select Committee on Government Policy for the Built Environment, current member of the Built Environment Select Committee. He's Vice President for the National Association of Local Councils and a patron of the Chartered Association of Building Engineers. And also in his professional life, Lord Lytton is a chartered surveyor. So he's got first hand experience of the issues we'll be talking about today, as well as the policy kind of things. Um, so we'll jump straight in because we've only got half an hour and we've got lots to cover on this subject. So, John, coming to you first, how did the Party Wall Act 1996 come about and what was it per what was its purpose? Uh, well, uh, thank you, Annie. Uh, and first of all, can I correct you on a couple of things? Because um, oh. some of the some of the uh, things you credit me with um, being involved with are, are things which I used to be involved with, but I'm no longer. For instance, I'm no longer on the Built uh, Environment Select Committee, uh, but that's only because I came off by rotation. It's one of the standard uh, things. So um, just to sort of put the, the, the record straight. Um, uh, now, the, the party wall... Um, uh, Act uh, 1996 came about really as a as a rescue operation, and this goes back to the mist of time uh, in the um, early years of the of the Thatcher uh, government, um, and the um, Margaret Thatcher was determined that she was going to abolish the GLC and uh, Ken Livingstone's uh, position with it, and also uh, as part and parcel of that the London Building Acts um, would be repealed because they were part and parcel of that structure. And embedded in the London Building Acts, of course, was the, were the principles of party wall legislation. So there had to be a rescue operation to extract those. And originally it was going to be uh, fronted by uh, my old chum, who actually sits on the Conservative bench, is uh, uh, Lord Lucas. Um, and he uh, approached me because he had been uh, or was on the point of being created a whip and therefore he would have been unable under the conventions of the House to take a bill through uh, Parliament. So he asked if I would get involved. And it was he that put me in touch with the late John Anstey, who I knew of by reputation, but I had never met, I think, up to that particular point. And... Um, so we, we we got going. So the thing was, to some extent, handed to me on a plate. And I pay tribute to the um, uh, the Pyramus and Thisbe Club, as it used to be there, because that had this wonderful little thing called the Green Book. And those of you, you know, who know anything about these things, I don't know if you can see the focus. It's it, it, This was the original um, uh, linen-bound book that um, was produced by the Pyramus and Thisbe Club and had all these uh, explanations of how the thing worked. And I think that part of the success of, of the whole mission was down to the fact this book was available. And John Anstey was able to produce large numbers of them for circulation to MPs and peers. Now, we were heavily constrained about what we were doing because it was extracting the existing law from the London Building Acts and putting it in uh, a national act. And it was also a private member's bill as opposed to a public bill. 
that had various consequences. Firstly, we couldn't um, easily update the, um, the the provisions at all. We really had to stick with what was already in the London Building Act. So, for instance, the um, the uh, the sanction for not serving a notice um, was lost. Uh, because that was considered to be inappropriate to have a criminal sanction attached to a private member's bill. And the other thing that was of concern was the inability to define surveyor. And this feeds back into something that that um, Laura has uh, uh, very expertly covered in her in her um, uh, doctoral um, dissertation, uh, which I've had the privilege of, of seeing, um, because, of course, um, that meant that we couldn't define the type of people who would be dealing with party war acts. And when um, Laura says that um, surveyors under the terms of the Act, the 1996 Act it now is, are unregulated, that's the origin of that lack of regulation. That's not to say that there aren't some very expert people in there, but by definition, it can be anybody other than a, than, a, than somebody who is a party to the matter. And John Anstey and I used to rather sourly comment, you know, it could be could be the cleaning lady or somebody like that that was appointed as your party boss. Because course, actually there was no no limit. And and of course, I say a lot of people are very expert and very diligent. They come from all sorts of different backgrounds. But some, it must be said, you know, let the side down, and that's that's um, a matter of, of 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 sadness, and I think some irritation to practitioners who who come across these people. So that was the uh, the the those were the parameters. The purpose was, of course, to provide the same rather successful regulatory process to party walls nationally to that which had applied in the old metropolitan area of central London. It was the old metropolitan area only that was affected by the London Building Act. Everything else was was dealt with um, by other means. And it was it, it fell outside what would have been the normal building control um, uh, big tent, as it were, because it actually wasn't a matter of, of building control. Um, it was really a matter of regulating a matter between private individuals. And so um, things like surveyor, which might have been a commonly understood in the cant of the trade within the metropolitan area of, of, of central London, um, didn't easily translate when you start putting it into the national context. And so there were all sorts of things uh, uh, pulling and, and pushing in, in different directions. Um, and so that was really what it what um, uh, the, 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 the genesis of the thing. And those were the parameters and the constraints under which we were operating. And I can certainly remember that the... Um, uh, having a discussion over the question of qualifications and who could do this work with the lawyers from the um, Department of Environment. And there was John Anstey and I tearing our hair as we were listening, they saying, well, no, you can't have this definition. We can't define it as being chartered surveyors or, you know, who else would we be? We would we would be made, we would be taking a segregationist approach to the thing, which we can't do in this context. And understanding these these difference between private um, uh, bills and public bills and what is essentially a public purpose in terms of regulating the built environment um, and uh, um, regulating matters between individuals is where this thing suffers constraints and 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 Laura's very uh, adroitly picked out a very large number of areas and in fact in virtually all of them, the fingerprints of the genesis of this whole um, bill are part and parcel uh, of, of where we are now and the things that she has identified as being, um, you know, needing tidying up. And I think it's a, it's, it's, it's a valuable look forward and, a, and an extremely valuable reflection on where we've come from. I'm also quite interested in the way you defended the bill because um, private members' bills are quite rare to be successful. So can you talk us through the process of that and what happened in this case? Uh, well, I suppose the geometry of the thing is that everybody was um, agreed that this uh, 
party walls um, module, if you like, needed to be saved and preserved. Otherwise, all sorts of things that had gone on for decades um, in uh, the metropolitan area of Greater London would actually fall by the wayside and there would be nothing taking its place. So it would have meant that there was a complete lacuna in what what happened. And there was a recognition within government that this needed to be sorted out. So to some extent, I was proxy for somebody else who would have taken it on, who was sitting on the on the uh, the uh, conservative benches at the time and was had been elevated to as it were part of the political establishment at that point, and so it had momentum in the degree that we had support from the um, uh, from the department, from from its from its lawyers and this sort of thing as to how this would going to go forward and. Mostly, you don't get that with a with a with a private bill unless the government agrees to take it under its wing. It stands very little chance of success, and virtually all the um, successful private bills have had some degree of buy-in uh, in terms of government recognising it's needed, but it doesn't want to front the thing up. There isn't a convenient legislative slot for it to go into, and uh, therefore. You know, the private member's bill is the way uh, forward. Uh, but it wasn't without some sort of heart stopping moments. I think I had about 100 and, 110 amendments at committee stage to my own bill because um, uh, this thing had got drafted and there was uh, a, a draft that the, the, the Pyramus and Thisbe Club had been working on for some time. Uh, and uh, of course, needless to say, it didn't say all the you know the nice you know, legal things that Laura would understand, uh, and uh, uh, you know surveyors tend to sort of say, oh, well, that's not how it happens in real practice. And uh, so this was this was to try and and get people to understand both the legal um, procedures that sit behind the 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 matter, and of course the functional reality of what's on the ground in other words you know what does it look like what is the alignment of this structure on whose land does it stand you know who has reciprocal rights or are they reciprocal or are they contained in some other uh, provision such as a deed or um, uh, some other arrangement between um, the, the parties well a lot of stuff that had to be sort of catered for, but we didn't have time because of the speed at which the uh, dismantling of the GLC and the Bill London Billing Act was was occurring, which was 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 pretty rapid. And bearing in mind, it was a large organisation and the London Building Act was a pretty substantial body of work. Um, we didn't have time to go tinkering around and trying to, um, you know, fine tune this and make it sort of better. So um, it's it's come through uh um with um you know quite a lot of um how should i say it messing about in the sense of of um it wasn't straightforward taking it taking it through because of the number of amendments but it did have a degree of government support and i don't think it was in any way seen as politically controversial so the other parties didn't see it as being something they would uh, ob object to you know what's there not to like about regulating the way people deal with um walls over which they both have um you know a a, a, a practical and functional um uh involvement um and so the i think that was what sort of got it through but we did uh, remember john anstey and i sitting uh through uh, w w watching um uh, it was Sir Paul Beresford um, taking the um, matter through the Commons because um, it was very much the end of the of the summer session and the recess was was nearly upon us, and uh, we stood there with our heart. We sat in the strangers' gallery with our hearts in our mouths, sort of waiting to see whether somebody would pop up and say object. In which case, you know, the thing <laughs> would have just fallen by the wayside, and there were one or two well-known characters in the Commons who were quite um, uh, um, up for you know, getting up and objecting for things that they thought might be a bit sort of shifty or anything like that, but it didn't happen. And so it, it was, um, 
you know, we didn't feel that we were, you know, on a successful crest of a wave uh, at any time. We were felt that we were under the cosh and at any minute the thing might fall apart and just be seen as too difficult. Um, but I think it's a, a, a testimony to um, what, um, uh, you know, the, the, the um, concern and the commitment to the whole process, you know, inside inside government and, and among, you know, political parties generally that um, that we got it through. And you're right. It's a it's a, a, a relatively scarce um, commodity. And it's very much I do feel in my case, very much having having to have been in the right place at the right time. And I don't regard that as any real uh, credit to me. I think the credit really rests on a lot of other people, including, as I said earlier, the huge amount of background work that's been carried out by the Pyramus and Thisbe Club over many years in terms of dissecting and analysing what could usefully be done in the future. So for the future, you know, the reforms that in an ideal world we would have liked to have inserted into the 1996 mm -hmm. Act, um, you know, is is still business uh, yet in progress. And, uh, yes, and we we'll, keep... come, we'll come on to the, the, re <laughs> the reforms that we might like to see in a little while. I'm just going to come to Laura now. Um, John sort of mentioned there a little bit of the, the disconnect between the lawyers and the surveyors and, and the technical side of things. Your PhD formulates a separate area of party laws and related disputes in its own merit. And and it provides a framework that brings together the areas of law and fact and helps to resolve those party wall disputes in a practical kind of way. Um, this is, includes the notice procedure under the Act, but also advocates alternative dispute resolution avenues. So given that this uh, podcast quite often focuses on dispute resolution, can you tell us a little bit more about the dispute resolutions options that are available when a party wall dispute arises? And um, in particular, I know you've got some views on mediation and how that can be used. Yeah, no, thank you very much, Annie. Um, and thank you for having me here. Uh, so um, actually, before I, ans I answer your question later on, we will come to potential amendments to legislation and policy. So that, that'll be an interesting um, one as well. So as you said before, party walls affect most of us, i.e. those who live in residential buildings, work in commercial buildings or manage commercial properties. And related disputes are often unnecessarily cost and time consuming and are having often a very negative emotional impact. And therefore, alternative dispute resolution as opposed to litigation is a desirable way forward as it can preserve or repair relationships between landowners and save money and time. <laughs> Agreement is to be encouraged, for example, with the assistance of party wall surveyor, mediator or adjudicator, whether the adjudication is non-statutory or statutory should construction works to a party wall fall under the Housing Grants Construction and Regeneration Act 1996 as amended. Most importantly, uh, the Party Walls Act 1996 does not apply where the building owner fails to trigger the notice-based dispute management mechanism created by the Act. And although this is a statutory breach, as John said earlier, it is not. Uh, it does not result in criminal liability. The problem is that the parties then lose protections that the Act provides. If the adjoining owner then suffers any damage or loss as a result of the building owner's works, this is then only actionable in court and private nuisance, and the building owner may also be liable to trespass. There are a number of issues with litigation. First, the adjoining owner needs to bring a claim in court. Um, secondly, the court can decide at its own discretion whether it considers it appropriate to award damages, injunctive relief, or specific performance, depending on the facts of each case. Thirdly, while courts will generally sympathize with the adjoining owner where it is a victim of damage caused by works performed by the building owner, which failed to serve the appropriate notice under the Act, there is no guarantee that the relevant court will actually grant the relief the adjoining owner is claiming for. Fourthly, if the adjoining owner cannot proceed with such a claim, for example, due to time or they just don't have enough money, uh, the building owner is unlikely to suffer the consequences of its breach of statutory duty. So finally, and importantly, th then we have the excessive time and cost. The parties should consider that going to court may end up being more costly than the actual value in dispute. But there are other cheaper and faster alternative dispute resolution options so that parties do not end up in court or can suspend court proceedings by agreement for the duration of ADR, alternative dispute resolution, and negotiate a settlement instead. So ADR options include, for example, negotiations between the parties in dispute, and this includes mediation, 
or expert determination, but this can also be quite lengthy and expensive. Courts encourage ADR, and where the parties refuse to participate without a reasonable foundation, this can result in court-imposed cost sanctions on either or both parties. So mediation. The advantages of mediations are speed, low cost. It can prevent having to go to court where the notice procedure under the um, Party Walls Act has not been triggered. It can be used in the middle of court proceedings where these can be suspended for the duration of the mediation so that the parties can find a solution. It can also be used where the parties contractually agree to opt out of the notice procedure under the Party Walls Act and that can be done. The parties have the option to keep the terms of the settlement confidential. Quite often the parties will often, um, they, they will mark relevant correspondence as without prejudice save as to costs, which means that while the parties can bring to the court's attention the fact that they attempted to mediate, the actual figures, conditions and facts remain con confidential and the court cannot have access to the information. The benefit of this is that a party can show that it proactively sought to mediate and the other party refused to cooperate, which the court may take into account when awarding costs. Another advantage, the parties have the freedom to accept the terms of the settlement, influence those terms, and should the terms prove unacceptable to them, just walk away if they really feel like that. There is no such flexibility in court. The relationship between the parties to a negotiated settlement is more likely to survive the dispute than if the parties went to court. Once a settlement has been agreed, the parties are more likely to honour the terms of the settlement agreement into which they entered voluntarily compared to a court judgment opposing terms which the parties may not be comfortable with. Um, mediation is one of the most effective avenues when seeking to resolve a dispute amicably, especially where the parties struggle to communicate without a third party, which is, in this case, it would be an independent mediator de-escalating the situation. And remember, during a mediation, parties don't even have to be in the same room should emotions be too heightened. So I always impress upon my clients, ask for legal advice early to save money and time in, long, in the long run. And I recommend to have your lawyer in the mediation with you. Usually this lasts less than a day and you uh, protect yourself from unnecessarily, unnecessary legal consequences and hidden pitfalls for a limited cost. Now, just very briefly about the framework and you mentioned um, the framework that I propose in my PhD thesis. So party wall disputes often touch on other areas of statute law that can impact on each other. For example, the Access to Neighboring Land Act, 1992, the Land Registration Act, 2002, the Human Rights Act, 1998, and many more. Um, then you've got the property rights, such as right of way, right of support, drainage rights, or rights to link, uh, link to easements, and tort, such as nuisance related to noise and vibration, or breaches of rights to light. And in addition to these areas of law, there are then factual matters that also need to be considered in the context of party war disputes, and that those include, for example, structural issues. Therefore, in my PhD thesis, I propose a problem-solving framework, a systematization of recurrent issues and recognition of warning signs prior to a dispute arising, basically a distinct legal area of party wars of its own merit. And this in turn gives rise to the potential for dispute prevention, if well managed, and provision of a selection of alternative dispute resolution solutions. This would mean also having lawyers specializing in the area of party walls rather than having purists such as property or construction or commercial lawyers advise on an interdisciplinary area. Currently, the focus is primarily on the Party Walls Act. While the notice procedure is useful, it is very narrow and therefore forms only a part of the Party Wall Dispute Resolution puzzle. Applying the Act in isolation without contextualization in connection with other statutes, statutory instruments, areas of law and fact can be very damaging to building and adjoining owners. Thanks, Laura. So you mentioned your framework there and, and ways that the Act could be improved. Looking at the future, the Act is now 25 years old and we might start to think about what we might want to see in changes and reform. Um, John, one of the things you mentioned earlier was was the question about whether the, the person carrying out the survey should be chartered or accredited in some way. Who does the work currently and, and do you think they should be accredited? Well, when you, uh, in connection with who does the work uh, at the moment, it's a very wide variety of, of, of people. And I think it should be said that, and I hope Laura would, would agree with this point, that um, given the number of party wall cases up and down the country, 
it still to some extent amazes me how few end up in serious um uh, uh you know litigation and 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 and, and legal disputes um so to that extent it's um it's a credit to those who to the majority of those who are involved and the majority do take their um their responsibilities very seriously because if you get it wrong you can do significant damage to somebody's um uh if not use enjoyment of their of of their property but then then it's is overshadowed by um uh, things that shouldn't have, have have happened and one comes across all sorts of things where bad decisions have been made where uh, inept outcomes to um party wall awards have have been reached uh, and some of those have of uh, you know come across my desk in in the past i think um the uh, my view is that they should be accredited in some way shape or form in sense that they should have a professional background there is a caveat to that and i say this from a personal uh, standpoint i come from a background of um, what used to be referred to as a general practice charter to there and we we were trained in all sorts of things including uh, survey and valuation land law uh, and, um, and and particularly things like uh, landlord and tenant, and also matters to do with 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 boundaries and and the um, you know everything from you know the law of property act onwards. Uh, and I'm uh, whilst some of that does take place, um, there has been a tendency in recent years for professionals to become much more specialised. And um, Laura herself refers to this question of of in the legal profession, you know, who do you go to? Is it a construction lawyer or is it some somebody else? And party walls crosses all sorts of uh, boundaries, if you'll excuse the the the, the, the pun, um, because um, it, it it is not only the, uh, the you know the questions of of of, of title and entitlement, um, but also questions of construction and. Uh, it is fundamentally a facilitative um, process, and this is often or has been in the past misunderstood by those who think that it is an adversarial approach. The whole idea of party wars is that it's not an adversarial approach. It's facilitative. The, fu the fundamental bit behind it is that um, you know, within within reason and subject to notice, a building owner should be entitled to carry out their works and of course you know they 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 shouldn't transgress other things like rights of light or or other easements um and it's getting making sure that those who do the work are sufficiently broad spectrum in their understanding of all these things as, as laura has, has rightly pointed out that needs to be caught up with uh in this instance and i think that there are uh Many very diligent people in all uh, uh, coming from lots of different professions, from architects, from engineers, and uh, not just um, surveyors and potentially people who come from perhaps an estate agency background who've got an interest in them. And I'm not worried about people who have an interest in it and make themselves aware and familiarize themselves with, with these things, but the general public need to know this and the legal profession need to know that they're dealing with somebody who has at least a basic understanding of the of, of the roadmap of how this this functions so i think there is a, a an unassailable case for some sort of accreditation how that's done is uh, uh, a a different matter and on that the uh, the pyramus and thisbe society of faculty of party wall surveyors and and others um have uh, views about the best way forward and it wouldn't be right for me to predict how that might be enshrined but i'm satisfied there should be some uh, accreditation process in, involved here which probably eliminate people like me you know old-fashioned unreconstructed general practice charter surveyors but never mind thanks John. laura what about you what, what do you think about reform i will answer that very shortly i just wanted to answer a question which i think has just disappeared because i clicked something but i wanted to address that i think in general there's a little surprise when i bring up mediation in the context of party walls and i wanted to address this um 
So oh, I don't think the attendees can see the question. So oh, I, I think the question was about um, why does, uh, you know, what, how does mediation relate to policy wall ma matters? Um, exactly. does, does it even relate at all? Yes, it does very much so. I think I did include it in my rather lengthy uh, answer. So I'm just going to distill it to three points. One, Party Walls Act does not always apply. So when the building owner does not trigger the notice procedure, that's it. And so that's mediation. Mediation can be very helpful. Number two, um, mediation can be applied at any point in time, even during court proceedings, and, and that will save you a lot of time and money. And number three, you can opt out of the Party Walls Act. So that's also when mediation you can agree in a contract to say we want to mediate instead or, or do something else. So just to put it out there. But um, thank you very much, Annie. So just to answer your question in terms of reforms. Um, <clears throat> so what would be helpful is, for example, um, and I think John already covered this uh, fully, introducing a definition of the party will surveyor. Also widening the definition of special foundations, which is currently limited to an old type of grillage or steel foundation. Both statutory and policy reforms are needed. So to ensure that alter alternative dispute resolution, such as adjudication, mediation, or even arbitration is mandatorily considered and at attempted by parties to party will disputes, leading to saving time and money and alleviating court's workload, and to create a party will dispute area of its own merit. Uh, the rationale is similar to that behind the Housing Grants, Construction and Regenerations Act 1996 as amended, as I said before, which is very popular in the construction industry. One option is to expand the existing statutory procedure under the Party Walls Act, so just leave it there and have some amendments done to it. Another option is to replace the Party Walls Act altogether with new legislation setting out in greater detail what alternative dispute mechanisms the parties should use, when, why and how, and to provide a mechanism or tool helping to solve all types of disputes that can relate to party walls. A checklist could be put in place that members of the public should have regard to when involved in a party wall dispute. This checklist could be presented either in the same manner as the current government's Party Walls Act uh, explanatory booklet uh, published in 2016. Alternatively, <laughs> excuse me, as an annex to the Technology and Construction Court Guide or as part of the practice direction. However, such a practice direction would require input from the Rules Committee, and this can be too prescriptive. Nevertheless, it's, it is a viable option. There is also the question of retrospective party wall awards. Currently, where a notice has not been served under the Party Walls Act and works have started and or have been completed without the service of such notice, the Party Walls Act does not apply retrospectively and therefore any related dispute would have to be decided in court unless parties agree otherwise by way of contract. A solution to this issue could be to amend the Party Walls Act so that it applies retrospectively or to ensure that any superseding legislation has a retrospective effect. Thanks, Laura. Um, we're, we're getting, well, we're almost over the, the time we want to spend. I've got one more question for John, because John, you were a surveyor for many years, so you've probably got um, some stories to tell of, of things that have gone wrong. I guess one of the difficulties with party walls is that you often have parties that are unfamiliar with the construction process. Um, so when we were planning this call, you, you, you spoke about the sort of slickness of the property and construction industry in the UK. And I think everyone probably on the call and in the industry would agree with that. You know, we, we, we have lots of processes in place. We do things in a certain way, but it's something that perhaps isn't recognised outside our sector. Do you think that's a real kind of hurdle and does that cause issues for people when when it comes to problems under the Party Wall Act, um, I think the the, um, the 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 Party Wall Act can, of course, uh, from a developer's uh, standpoint, be be a, a, a piece of unpleasant you know, grit in the oyster, as far as that is concerned, um, and um, uh, particularly as uh, as um, as I've said earlier, uh, some people look at this as a, as a as a means of of carrying forward a by by proxy, something they fail to do in, for instance, the planning context. So you end up with a with a with a uh, sort of contested party wall thing that actually doesn't derive its its origins from from the real uh, property interests of the party, but by by some other. Uh, matter. They either don't like the neighbour or they don't like the fact that there's going to be housing development next door and, and so on and so forth. Um, I think there's there has to be a um, a, a better degree of, of, of general education about uh, about this and that uh, and what the scope of, of the thing is. The um, uh, there are, of course, lots of um, 
you know, horror stories. I mean, there was a, um, a facade of a building that fell down in uh, in um, southwest London um, not so very many months a months ago, uh, and I did pull the leg of one of my uh, uh, regular um, uh, 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 colleagues in in the party wall sector and uh, said was that one of yours uh, and uh, he said oh he said no actually I dodged the bullet on that one he said I was um he said I saw um uh, uh trouble coming and and declined to uh the 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 request to accept the appointment as, as a surveyor so you know one has to be a bit careful about some of these things because what had happened was they'd, they'd basically been doing the basement work and they'd undermined the facade of the building and as a result the whole thing fell out into the street um which got onto the front page of the uh, of the London Evening Standard. So um, <laughs> not sort of not sort of uh, prime time coverage oh, you really man. really want to want to have. Um, uh, so um, uh, yes, I think that the, we do need to make sure that the thing operates uh, slickly and effectively, um, that it is dealt with in a in a timely manner. And that was part of the driver, I think, behind the whole question of party walls in the first place, you know, going back to Victorian times. You know, we don't want this thing mm -hmm. filed up in, in a legal procedure. And I'd like to think we could continue with, with that. But there are other things that Laura has rightly pointed out that need to be dealt with and understood as part and parcel of that that um that work uh, uh not only the construction but also the other legal rights um that that surround all this and Laura, what about when it comes to party walls and construction related issues um are you thinking oh, about the disaster you, stories or um or, or um, <laughs> <laughs> um well the um uh I think the, the the main problems, if that's what you're asking me for, uh, seem to have come because people have um, there's a disconnect between what is put in the party wall uh, award uh, and the understanding of um, how shall I say it, what needs to be done as opposed to what legitimately can be done mm -hmm. um, in the hands of the building uh, contractor. Um, I remember one situation where I'd done an award and, and uh, some months later, the um, adjoining owner co complained that he'd got a problem with his um, with his uh, chimney stack. You know, the fire was smoking uh, or the appliance wasn't functioning properly that was attached to the bottom of the, uh, of the chimney stack. And turns out that uh, the work had been done by the adjoining owner. They ordered, a, ordered in a piece of steel and either they ordered it too long and hadn't cut the end off it or else they just stuck it in in a rather careless fashion. And a large chunk of, of steel um, was sticking into the, um, into the flue and that was causing a problem. And uh, it's, it's quite messy and, and inconvenient to uh, remove that because where do you, where'd you cut a hole to get at the piece of steel? And then you've got to have somebody with a, grinder or an oxyacetylene cutter or something like that in a domestic environment so you're know, talking about a fairly industrial type of process in somebody's mm. bedroom if you please or something like that and this sort of thing is 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 you know really brings the whole thing into uh into um disrepute and i remember when when the uh, the party wall bill as it was, was was going through parliament we had lots of representations from people who were um in the loft conversion industry who didn't like the idea of having to serve a notice before they um uh, stuck a piece of steelwork into the um into the party wall in order to support um a loft conversion because as you know you open it up and therefore you know uh supporting purlins and things like that get get removed and you need a, need something that spans from one side of the property to the other to support the retained portions of the roof and um uh, they didn't like the idea of that they thought it was perfectly all right to sort of knock a hole through and uh tell the next door neighbor oh we'll be back on monday to, to to fix the whole sort of thing and then find that they've disappeared without fixing anything at all um but um uh, and there so there are there are a few problems and particularly and in fact i'd say mainly in the domestic context because people are mm -hmm. using small jobbing building contractors for whom this sort of procedure is put it bluntly a bit alien um mm. and um you know they think in terms of serving a building notice and then getting on with the job thank you very much okay. and 
one doesn't want to interfere or fetter these things, but it does need to be a realization that actually you can do an awful lot of damage to somebody's adjoining property. And uh, as as Laura has pointed out in her thesis, you can you can generate disputes costing many times the uh, the value of, of the work and certainly of the value of the cost of the remediation if you're not careful. Um, and we used to sort of refer to the the the, the construction uh, the people that didn't sort of take care as as cowboy builders. You know, mm -hmm. a, a term that is still in current. I don't like to think of, of people as being being cowboys, but they are inclined to be very fixated on what they need to do: get in, do the job, get out, get paid. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, that's a, a a little bit of a problem because as soon as you start adding procedures, then costs go up you need a greater degree of competence and yeah. that do you want to chime in on this one Laura? um any i'm so sorry i just actually wanted to very briefly answer a, a very good question uh, a gentleman called mark has raised and that is uh, in relation to whether the adjoining owner whether they are likely to opt out of the act and lose their protections um yes that it can happen because rather than giving up all of their rights mark it's about uh entering into a contract into a formal agreement where they where the parties agree another way forward they could um they may want an expert determination or mediation instead or something else in which case the adjoining owner would not lose their rights but have different means of protection which suits them better thanks Laura. um do you want to chime in on the on the construction side of party wars act um me yes sorry yeah yeah. Yes, so, yeah no i i was just going to say that uh party walls are essentially structures that affect neighboring pop properties and matters relating to the structure of a party wall may arise including um for example cracks in a party wall subsidence underpinning um thickening raising repairing cutting into a party wall increasing or decreasing its height exposing it demolishing it fully rebuilding it there's so much so mm -hmm. when incurring structural issues imp impacting party walls section two of the party walls act should be consulted in relation to the connected rights and obligations of the building and adjoining owner in order to manage dispute avoidance measures, such as an open line of communication between them and managing any costs and losses linked to structural issues caused by the section. While signs pointing to structural issues may appear to be subtle to begin with, an engineering survey could be, for example, carried out in order to find out whether there are any underlying structural issues that um, their cause where the related responsibility falls and rights and obligations of neighboring owners. This is to prevent or at least mitigate damage caused by such structural issues. And of course, if done in time and in advance, it can save a lot of trouble and, and disputes. Thanks, Laura. I think that's all we've got time for. Um, there are a couple of other questions we've not got around to, but we're well over time this morning. Um, it's such a huge topic to try and cover in just half an hour. So a uh, big thank you to Laura and John for joining us this morning. Um, yeah. As always, this will be up on the YouTube channel if you want to watch it later, as with all the previous episodes. Next month, we're going to be looking at um, public buildings and some of the issues that have come up, such as the REAC roof planks and all of those kind of problems that we're seeing in the headlines at the moment so um do jo keep an eye out for that one because the details will be up very very soon thank you both for joining us uh this morning and thank you to everyone who's online and um we'll see you next time thank you thank you thank so you. much bye bye, -bye. bye, -bye.